What's going on, everybody? It's Dr. Chris Featherstone here for yet another episode of Unscripted Listen. It's Tuesday night. You know what that means? Have some of the biggest, the baddest, the best wrestlers of today and yesterday, year, and tonight is no different. You know why? Because I've got the man in the building. He, You, you might know him from uh, Thunder and Lightning. You may know him as the Cobra. He may, you know, he, you know, this, this, there's, there's a person who does this right now, right? His name is Dan Housen, and he's trying to curse people, right? But he wasn't the originator of that pose. This person who I'm gonna bring on tonight is the originator of the pose, so he should deserve the credit for it, actually. And you may know him as the NWO Sting. Uh, just another awesome addition to the awesome, fun, exciting NWO shenanigans that was going on. We thought that Sting went rogue for a little bit. I know I personally did. Sting is my all-time favorite wrestler. And I was like, no way. And then as soon as I saw him, I was like, you know what? Uh, this person isn't Sting. I know Sting. Sting's my all-time favorite. But I think it was a really, really cool addition to the feud and he actually launched that to become to have a very successful career in New Japan Pro Wrestling as their actual representative of the NWO. So without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, I'll bring him on the show tonight. He is the NWO Sting, Jeff Farma. How are you tonight, my man? I'm good. Thanks for having me. You did your homework. That's good. Yes, indeed. Yeah, I'm a, I'm a big wrestling fan, so uh, <laughs> it's a uh, you know it's it was easy for me to uh, to watch it because the thing is I, I watched all of that had a brief refreshing, but uh, I mean I watched all I've been watching wrestling since like 1985 or six, and so uh, I, I it's funny because I had a little bit of refresher always as a journalist. It's important for you to do your research. And so I was like, yeah, I remember all this stuff. I remember all these things. Thunder Lightning was about 94, right? Yep. And then Cobra, you know, came about a year later, 95. The the, the gimmick was uh, Sergeant Craig put Pitbull Pittman left you out in the jungle, right? <laughs> <And so Yeah. laughs> whole, 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 uh, angle all that well. But, you know, yeah, they, yeah. Of Cobra was kind of like a paramilitary, you know, special mm -hmm. operative kind of secret, you know, thing. So, mm -hmm. um, Ray and the whole thing. So, yeah, we, but it wasn't really uh, necessarily the 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 script or the the narrative. The storyline wasn't all that well thought out, actually. Yeah, it was fun. Yeah, they just <clears throat> they they just realized how much of a uh, stud you looked like, and they just wanted to throw you on TV somehow. Man, I think that's what it was, Jeff. You know, we had you know at in, in WCW, and there's we we had a lot of talent. You know, there's a lot of talented guys in the company that just really didn't have a spot, you know, or really have a place. I mean, all the Chris Jericho, all of those guys started out, you know, around that time, and it was yep. was you know kind of hard to get a to get some of the uh, spotlight, so to speak. 
Mm-hmm. Indeed. All right, my man. Uh, about to dive into these questions. You got anything you want sure. to uh, let the listeners know about before we uh, get in? No, nothing. Just uh, happy to be here and 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 talk about the the career. Awesome, good stuff, man. Start with Aaron. He's uh, asking, what was uh, your experience like working in Global Wrestling Federation? I wasn't in Global Wrestling Federation, so I was in the International Wrestling Federation, which was out of Orlando. And actually, uh, Thunder uh, and I uh, were the tag team champions of that league. And that was a guy named Eddie Mansfield actually ran that, that company at that time. And again, there's a lot of talent in there. We were running out of Orlando and uh, uh, the Smoking Guns were there. If you remember those guys, you know, oh, they yeah. were, and we actually wrestled them a lot. And there was a lot of talent coming out of Florida. Blackjack Mulligan came down there and was working with us for a little bit. And, uh, but that, that was the, the wrestling federation that I started out in. Very nice. I was like, <clears throat> I saw that question. I was like, I watched just about every episode of Global. I don't remember you in Global, but. I don't know. You might have had a a sneak peek in there somehow. I, you know, I might have, I might have missed you, but I, I, I'm glad to know that I'm sane enough to realize that you didn't, you didn't work at Global. So uh, the IWF instead of GWF. Uh, Rorito is asking, greetings from Puerto Rico. Whose idea was it for you to be the NWO Sting? What advice, if any, did Steve Borden give you while you were trying to portray his character? Uh, that's a good question. It was really something that um, I believe Eric Bischoff was really the one who who kind of came up with the idea. And you have to ask him about how that kind of came about. But uh, Dallas Page, who I knew and, and had worked with, especially down at the power plant in the early days, um, you know, was the one who approached me and said, hey, you know, Eric wants to do this. And I think it was basically because I, I was similar size as Steve. We were similar built about the same size. And I think they believed physically I could kind of pull it off. And but I remember, you know, them telling me, especially, you know, uh, Eric, they said, look, if this gets out, you know, we're going to we're going to squash it. So they, they really wanted to kind of kayfabe it or, or keep it you know, under wraps and not let everybody know what was happening. So a lot of those that the information you're asking really was above my pay grade, so to speak. I was just kind of doing what they told me at the time. But. Um, you know, Eric would probably answer that question a lot better than than I could. And as far as Steve, you know, he was really, I mean, you know, cool. We we actually both went down and did prosthetics at um, at the early time. They actually put little prosthetics on my forehead because they did a mold of his head and they did a mold of my head. And then they had to add some stuff to to my face to kind of make it look real. I wore contacts in the beginning because uh, my eyes are lighter. His were dark. And uh it was, it, to be honest with you, it was terrible because the contacts, I had never worn contacts. And so that was tough to kind of get used to. And later we ended up, you know, removing all that stuff because once I painted up, you really couldn't tell the difference, you know, uh, the, with the paint on. So yeah. the process, all that kind of stuff was kind of eventually kind of just, uh, you know, thrown to the wayside. Yeah. I actually listened to uh, a clip of uh, Eric Bischoff's 83 Weeks podcast. Uh, it was about, uh, aired about a year ago. And he was <clears throat> talking about just the formation of the NWO Sting character. And he said that uh, he was having lunch with you in Tokyo um, last year sometime. Yeah. Yeah. Right. yeah. And he said that he wished that he would have asked you, you know, more about that. And he said that he didn't, he said that he couldn't take full credit of like coming up with a character. He said it was like a compilation of like thoughts with different people of just kind of forming it all together with a bunch of thoughts put together, you know, just kind of thrown uh, at each other, you know, I guess with the, with the execs. And so um, that's a little bit more meat to that. I don't think it was something that they were planning on really keeping, right? I think it was, you know, the initial time I came out was when I attacked Lex Luger, you know, on the limo, right? Yep. And everybody, it was Sting. And, um, but of course, that's a great thing to do to annoy, you know, the WCW for the NWO is to have somebody you're, you know, throwing out there, causing trouble, you know, doing all this stuff as an imposter. Mm-hmm. So the idea was good. I don't think it was something they were going to keep. 
But I, if I remember, Hogan, Hogan liked it. And, and he said, hey, you know, we can kind of we can keep this around. And, and Hall and Nash, too. I think everybody thought, you know, hey, this could be you know, something we can kind of hang on to. So I think, for, you know, it benefited me that they said, hey, you know, it's not a one time shot where we just kind of do this and that's it. And it's like, oh, yeah, we got you, blah, blah, blah. So they kind of kept it which was, uh, you know, I, I was grateful for because you know, it was fun to be a part of that whole whole thing at the time. Yeah, and to piggyback off of that, you know, it it, it had a lot more extended shelf life than seemingly what it was intended to do because you ended up catapulting, you know, and having a pretty good career over New Japan. What was, I know I, know I interviewed you on my Pancakes and Power Slam show years ago, um, and I know we talked about that briefly, but what catapulted this, you know, the, the, the NWO staying temporary thing to go over to New Japan? I know that New Japan was doing an NWO Japan gimmick, you know, with, yeah. with Chono and Muda and things like that. And why were you picked as, you know, one of the members of NWO 2000? Because it actually benefited you very well. Yeah, and that's a great question. And, and here's the answer to a lot of that is that so – you know, the NWO was going simultaneously in the United States and Japan, you know, they had some reciprocity where they had, you know, uh, Japanese wrestlers coming to the United States, like Yuji Nagata and, and Nakanishi and some of those guys. And then they were sending talent, you know, where there was an exchange of talent. Scott Norton, who, who was the IWGP heavyweight champion over there, was had just come into WCW, I think, a little prior to that, but was still mm-hmm. built in, in New Japan. So... The, to answer the question, so Hogan, Nash, Hall, you know, all those kind of top guys, which you would call the top tier guys, they weren't going to really go over to Japan and do any kind of long term commitment. They might have made an appearance. And of course, we all did the, the big Tokyo Dome show, um, but they're not going to, you know, commit to a tour. You know, the tours, as you know, you know, uh, are, are long and, and arduous. And they, I don't think they were going to do that. So they said, hey, you can take. You know, Bagwell, you can take Farmer, you know, you can take N.W. Sting, Scott Norton, who's already been over there doing it the whole time. You can you can obviously take him. And Mike Rotundo came over when he was part of it. Um, So, you know, they kind of worked this kind of bottom tier, you know, guys of the of the N.W.O. that that they but they they definitely wanted the N.W.O. presence. So it, it worked out you know, really, really good for me because the bulk of my career actually ended up being in, in New Japan. And, um, you know, they happened to really like, you know, my my character as N.W. Sting over there because, I, you know, I was a, you know, they knew we were two different things. They knew, you know, Steve Borden was Sting and they knew that I was the N.W.O. Sting, which is, I always used N.W.O. I never went, you know, a Sting, of course. So they knew I was a, a different you know, person. And they actually liked that we were two separate things. And to kind of go back to your question a little bit, there could have been so much more done, you know, with the NWO whole sting angle. I could have obviously had a match with Steve and then we could have tagged together. There's so much, so many things you could have done with two NWO kind of sting guys. You know, there could have been a whole bunch of, of, of uh, storylines that, that, you know, and, and again, that, that was something I had no you know involvement in, in the storylines and how they were going to go down, how they're going to be written. But, you know, it ended up being a, a great move for me. I ended up, you know, wrestling over there for about five years and probably three of those, two or three of those years, I, I was wrestling full time as NWO sting. Nice, nice. That's awesome. Uh, Jimmy's asking, uh, what was it like facing talent such as Chris Benoit, Bobby Eaton, and would you have ever faced Sting in a match if he had the opportunity? <laughs> Absolutely. I would have uh, loved to have had a match with Steve. Um, you know, I, I, I wrestled with Chris. Chris was on tour. You know, I, I had a great relationship with, with Chris Benoit and uh, you know he was amazing. Bobby Eaton, uh, you know one of the best in the business. You know I, I was fortunate enough to wrestle with with all these guys and and, and anybody really that spent some time in Japan, um, you know they they were it, they were really you know remarkable wrestlers because you know uh, Eddie Guerrero and you know everybody that did some some long term stuff over there they 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 learned the craft very well. I mean you had no choice. You you had to be had to be able to to kind of perform at that level mm-hmm. yeah absolutely you know it's interesting because i've interviewed so many people
You broke up just a minute, Chris. So I don't know that's on my end or your Yeah, there we go. Okay, you're back. Yeah. We good? Okay. Yep. Um there's a lot of people who uh um I've interviewed and wanted to hear their take on uh, the relationship with Chris Benoit and how Chris Benoit was, you know, a lot of people don't ask Jeff Farmer, you know, how was working with Chris Benoit and was, you know, were there any, you know, it's, 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 it's hard retrospectively to, to, you know, to really uh, organically answer this, but, you know, the, to the best of your ability, were there any type of character traits that you saw in Chris Benoit that was eccentric or was he, was he kind of, you know, to himself, was he, was he sociable? Like how was he backstage in the locker room? You know, again, this is a touchy subject. Of course, I will broach it just a little bit because, mm -hmm. you know, I, I had a very good relationship with Chris and uh, he was always nice with me. I was always nice with, with him. I never saw him, you know, he he was a he. To, in my opinion, you know what what I think happened to Chris Benoit, and, th and this is and nobody's really asked me about it that much. But I think you know he had some some CTE, you know, some some, you know, from all the bumps he took, and he used to diving headbutt all the time. And I think there was some possible brain damage, you know, from 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 the business and you know you see it in football you see it in in these places and and these guys they become different they change their personality changes they they you know they uh, try to kill themselves you've seen it in sports so that that's i mean that's my only real explanation for that and maybe that's me trying to rationalize but you know i think it was it was some type of you know brain brain damage from from his career in in wrestling that that's just my you know, my, my way to maybe rationalize, I, I don't know, but, but, uh, you know, I, I always got along very well with Chris and, and he was a, he was a good guy to me. Yeah. It makes sense to me, Jeff. I mean, I'm, my, my PhD is in, 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 in forensic psychology. I also have a master's degree in psychology. So I'm, I'm a psychology doctor. I've done extensive uh, papers and research on CTE. So uh, I know quite a bit about CTE and I actually have written about Chris Benoit and his, you know, uh, stuff. And so, uh, you know, some, some CTE things in correlation with the ocean, uh, method with a big five personality trace. And so interestingly enough, you know, I saw from my research, a lot of CTE, you know, um, characteristics with the data that we have, you know, when it comes to Chris Benoit, I've, I've, I've looked at police reports and everything like that. So, you know, I can definitely see some correlation with that. So, we never know we weren't there um we can only speculate and uh yeah. so yeah that's all we got so yeah indeed uh next we have uh let's see I'm trying to get the um okay we got uh nexus um have you ever tried to go to wwe you know i, I went once after so the WCW ended up you know folding basically and I remember getting a call from JJ Dillon who said you know this was actually uh, right when it's when it kind of closed down he said he gave me a call and let me know I wasn't going to be that they weren't going to use me but I was already in Japan at that time but basically they the WCW was paying my my salary in Japan because I was exchanged for WCW and I remember the day that that I left um, you know, I called Masa Saito, who is really my, my boss over there in, in New Japan. And he said, he told me, don't go to WWF. He said, please just, you know, can you, 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 you work for me, we'll keep everything the same and just don't go to WWF, please come here. And so, so I did. I mean, it was one of those things that I, I remember, you know, actually having some champagne because I got fired and hired really on the exact same day because, you know, I told Masa really just to let him know what was happening. And uh, but later on after that, I, I did one like dark match or something in, in the in the WWE, but it, but it didn't you know, they switched it up at the end and I, it was just not very it wasn't very I didn't like the experience and it was just not one of those things that that went well for me. I, I don't know if they're, you know, it just kind of didn't didn't work out. And, I, and after that, I was just kind of like, you know, not not interested. Who was your points of contact when you were in WWE? 
Um, it would have been, um, oh, what's his name? That when it's uh, Laurinaitis, yeah. I think. Yeah, John Laurinaitis. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. the guy, I think I talked to, um, but I, I don't, I don't think he knew me. I don't think they knew that much about me. You know, kind of a thing. So I, I didn't really have a good, you know, sh anybody in there. And at the time, you know, I think, you know. Uh, Dean Malenko was there and maybe even Finley and, you know, those guys knew me. Right. But, but I don't know if they were in the positions that they, that they ended up getting, but um, yeah, I, I didn't really know John Laurinaitis. I know he, he worked in, in all Japan a lot. So again, anybody who did that, that tour, I have to, you know, was able to, he has to be pretty good. So, but, but I didn't really, you know, know him hardly at all. 94, 95. Um, oh, so you might have just missed him, right? Because he was the dynamic dudes, right? With him and Ooh. him and uh, Shane, was it? Uh, him and Shane to tag, tag together as the dynamic dudes. In in what what federation? WCW. Dynamic dudes. <laughs> I don't. I don't. Maybe. I mean, I yeah. didn't. I, you know, I knew. I mean, I think the. And then you know, the, the the road warriors came in there, you know, at, at one point, I'm pretty sure. Weren't they doing something then? And and I, yeah. I think he was around because his brother was there probably. But, um, yeah, I, I, it might have been. I might have been kind of more in Japan at that time. Um, yeah, they were a little bit. There were a few years before you. So they are 89 and 90. Dynamic yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, Shane and, and Ace. So, yep. <laughs> yep. Just missed you by a few years. Uh, let's see here. Uh, Elvis is asking, um, what was it like being backstage with Virgil and Dusty Baby? <laughs> you know, Dusty, you know, Dusty's an icon in the business, you know, and, uh, you know, I, I remember the, you know, the first time I'm in the back in the, in the dressing room and I, I really was, uh, not necessarily a wrestling fan, pro wrestling fan. I mean, I, I came from a football background and so, you know, I mean, I, I remember growing up as a kid seeing it, you know, uh, Gordon Soley and, and that because I grew up in Florida. So Florida Championship Wrestling. And, and, and I think Dusty was in that some. So, mm -hmm. you know, I, I again, wasn't that big of a fan. But when you're backstage and you see Dusty, you know, it's like you know, you've seen him on TV and all of a sudden you're seeing him in person and Ric Flair and all those guys. And so it was, uh, it was kind of thrilling. And Dusty was always, you know, very nice to me and, and gave me good advice. Um, you know, I think he came down to the power plant a few times when we were working there and, uh, you know, just, you know, he's a, he's an icon in the business. And, uh, you know, I knew some of his sons, you know, of course that wrestled, you know, in, in WCW. So yeah, Dusty, Dusty was amazing. Yeah. Uh you worked with you worked with Dustin. Um yep. you know, he's 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 still still at it, man. Uh, still yeah. At it at AEW. yeah. Cody, you know, wasn't around then yet. He was too right. young. And yeah. uh, you know, and then of course also the yeah, it, it was it was uh yeah. Barry was good, you know, of course. And and they had another well, there was another brother too. What was the other one that was uh he also had a cowboy gimmick, I think. But Anyway. Yeah, I'm not sure. Um, so, what with with Cody with, with Cody? Did you ever um, see him? Because you know, in interviews Cody would say that he you know he would travel with Dusty every now and then and, and, and go to the shows and stuff like that. Did you ever see well, little I, Cody Rhodes? I think I did. I think I do remember. I know he was an amateur wrestler, and Dusty would talk about his amateur wrestling. So, you know, I, mm -hmm. I, I remember him. You know, as a young young guy. And uh, hearing about his amateur, you know, wrestling uh, accolades. So nice. I definitely remember hearing that. Very nice. Um, Ronald is asking, what? Who, who was your best friend in the WCW roster? Wow. Um, you know, I, I mean, Scott Norton and I became, you know, really close because of of uh, New Japan. And, and, and I really, you know, would not have made it in new japan really without without scott's guidance and um and just really telling me what to do and and what they expected and and how to work and the way they wanted to work it was a little more snug and and uh so probably scott norton he's he's also the one guy that i continue to stay in touch with to this day and uh, scott is like a brother to me and uh we're, we've always been really close so he's one I would say, and I, and I still, like I said, talk to him to this day. 
Very nice. Very nice. I got to get uh, in contact with him. I have his number. I got to, I don't know what I'll do with that. I got to get him on the show uh, soon so he can uh, yeah, build. Yeah, I'll be on the hot seat and get some Q and A together. So I'll, I'll get with you. Um, Roy is asking. Uh, let's see. We got a lot of. We got about four minutes. Let's do a four minute uh, lightning round here. Roy, Roy is asking. Uh, Scott Hall was he a good person? Yeah, I, I I got along very well with Scott Hall. Scott actually is from Orlando, and I went to the same gym as him. I, I played football at UCF in Orlando, and I remember after I, I went to, I think it was Orange Avenue Gym, which is one of the oldest gyms in the country, and Scott was training there. And I, and I remember going up and asking him about you know pro wrestling, and uh, and uh, yeah, he was uh, he was kind of. You know, just starting out at that point, but you know, I he, he worked with me in Japan. He came over, you know, actually to Japan and did some tours over there. And I always got along along very well with Scott. He he was a heck of a talent man, heck of a talent. Yeah. That guy, that guy, and especially for a big man, Scott could do could do it all. Mm -hmm. Yep. Uh, Jimmy's asking, uh, would you ever wrestle again if you could for one more match and against who, if you if you want? You know, I, I wrestled again when uh, when I saw Eric in 2019. I, I did. I went back and wrestled in New Japan. Um, you know, uh, I mean, I, I guess a fantasy match would be somebody maybe who's, who you know, Eddie Guerrero, who I, I wrestled and had some amazing matches. I'd like to, you know, to wrestle Eddie again if that was ever kind of possible through time. But um yeah, n nobody in in real particular kind of thing. But you know, I, I've been fortunate enough to work with a, a lot of the the greats in in wrestling, and uh, to me, that's a that's been an amazing experience. I imagine that you would want to face Sting to battle. Yeah, uh, that would be all awesome. real Sting. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it'll come out. I could still come out and uh, you know cause some problems. There you go. There you go. Take take a little time off and uh, grow your hair back uh, and and come come back as the NWO thing again. <laughs> uh, let's see here. Elvis is asking, um, uh, did you ever work with Perry Saturn? Uh, Perry was in the WCW at the time when I was there, um, but I don't think I ever worked Perry Saturn. Uh, he was there. And uh, they had that little click in the in the WCW that they were doing, but but I never the worked Perry. Squad? I don't recall ever working Perry Saturn. The click that you're talking about was the Ravens flock. Yeah, the, they had a little group. You know, uh, uh -huh. I don't know who all was in there, but they had like a little group in WCW at the mm -hmm. time. Yeah, Kidman was in there. Yep. Perry Saturn, uh, Sick Boy, yep. uh, Ron Reese was in there. Yep. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Got a good. Memory. Thanks, man. Thanks, man. I, people call me the wrestling uh, encyclopedia, man. I, it's, uh, it's just just a big it's just a big patch of memory that uh, you know. Uh, uh, you are. I guess it makes me a good journalist. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's true. <laughs> that's true. <laughs> What's that? I said you are a doctor, so you got to have a good brain. I have to. I'm a doctor in psychology, so if I don't have a good brain, being a doctor in psychology, I, I'm uh, choosing the wrong occupation, that's for sure. Uh, yeah, I just, you know, I, I like. I'm a big trivia guy. So I, I love trivia. Like Jeopardy is one of my favorite uh, oh, yeah? game shows. I've actually been to Jeopardy before. I've actually been to a live crowd in Jeopardy before. Yeah, and uh, it was fun. It was fun, and. Um, I used to play it all the time. I used to get about 15 answers right a game. And it was just, uh, I just, I just like it. So I, with trivia, I always, um, uh, on my show, on one of my shows, I used to do trivia like every single week with my fans. And yeah. uh, I just like random, random trivia. So I try to like go to the Oops. recesses of my brain and remember the, those things. You got, uh, okay, you got to, you got to, you got a no, trivia question for us, <laughs> Dave. the way they, who is Billy Kidman? You know that kind of thing, right? Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Answering the former question, right. yeah. yeah. <laughs> it was, it was, and he was actually Kidman was, uh, he he would scratch himself all the time. Yeah. That was, yeah, I, his, 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 I actually, uh, I, I knew, I, I really liked Billy Kidman. We were in WCW together, and again, you know, he's an amazing. He had a he had a lot of talent, you know, and it was, you know, it was a shame because you had this group of guys, and and I would put Billy Kidman in there that just tremendously talented but there just was only so much 
TV time, you know, so much air time. And, and the top guys, you know, they're not, and, and you can't blame them. They worked hard to get where they were, but they're not going to, you know, let that, you know, get away. So they're going to make sure that they take care of themselves and they have the best time slot. So it was, it was just difficult. We had, we had too much, you know, a lot of talent and not enough, uh, you know, air time to put everybody in or to get everybody, you know, a chance. So, so it, it was, you know, it was just a kind of a tough time. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, you know, because regardless of, uh, you know, uh, what people think it's in the record books, Billy Kidman has a victory over Hulk Hogan and it can't be wow. erased. So yeah. awesome. Yeah. Uh, Billy, I've been him in a super long time, but, uh, you know, I've always, but I was very fond of Billy. Nice. Last question from Philip. What was it like to be in the war games match at WCW fall brawl 1996? Yeah, that that was what you got to refresh my memory on that. What was was that the with Hogan and Lex and all that kind of stuff, right? Or yeah, yeah. That, well, you well you uh, that that's when Sting actually came out, right, and just kind of clean house because he was out, he was gone for a while, the absence, and then you came in and filled yeah. in, and then I think that's when Sting actually Sting actually came in and just kind of clean house and left. Yeah, I have to. That's when I had Lex in or somebody in the in the, the Scorpion, right? I, mm -hmm. I had to, Mm -hmm. And he, yeah, that, that actually, that's a great question. And it really was, you know, pretty incredible. I mean, the, the crowd, you know, it, it was just the, the company was really hot at that time. The angle was really hot. Um, you know, I remember them going crazy thinking that it was really Steve when I first came out and everybody was cheering, thinking I was coming to the rescue, but then I didn't, you know, so, mm -hmm. Um, you know, and it was all the top guys in there, you know, so I'm nervous. I don't want to make a mistake and do something wrong. So, you know, it was a lot of pressure, but it was a blast, you know, and uh, it, I, I was one of my favorite uh, memories of the business is really is, is that particular event. It, it was so much fun. Yeah, indeed. Jeff, it's been a pleasure, man. Um, I know that you're pretty incognito. I appreciate you uh, coming on the show tonight. You don't have any socials or anything like that, right? You just kind of, you know, I, I, haven't, I haven't. I really don't do a whole lot of interviews and stuff. So, uh, but Chris, this has been a lot of fun. Thank you so much for having me on the show, and uh, I, you know, I really enjoy talking to, to especially really, you know, uh, fans like you that, that are, are, you know, you're beyond fans. You're, you're like, you know, you know, all the stuff, you know, everything. And that's, uh, it makes it a lot more, more enjoyable for me to, to talk about someone that really knows, knows everything, you know, it's, yeah. it's just, I appreciate it. I, oh, I, you know, my, my, my favorite actor is Chris Farley. I could be like Chris Farley for me too. Like mm, you, you were, you were, you remember when uh you uh and I have my index cards you know like uh and you give me one liners like Paul McCartney did back in the day yeah and he was like uh that was awesome and just get real mad like idiot you know so uh <laughs> I used to be a huge <laughs> SNL buff in the nineties so. <laughs> you might have to start a comedy show too on the side <laughs> I was voted class clown in my high school actually oh that doesn't surprise yeah. me. Yeah, thank you, man. I appreciate it. Jeff, it's been a pleasure, man. I had a blast. I hope you did too. All right. Thank you so much. All right, my man. Bye-bye. All right. Bye.